Can you just start telling me your story, you know, how you got to where you are now, especially, you know, you said you have a son, like yeah. talk a little bit about your family and your work and how you got to where you are now. Okay. Um, so I worked in the National Health Service, the UK, NHS, for about 30 years. I spent the first half of that working as a therapist. I'm an occupational therapist and a drama therapist. And I worked with adults who had really severe mental health problems. I loved doing that. Yeah. I loved um, help seeing people move from a place of stuckness and lack of belief in themselves to finding what they wanted to do in life and realizing that they could do it. And that's kind of a thread that has continued through through my life and through my careers. So I spent you know, a good 15 years doing that. And then it felt like it was time to move on. Now, another important part of my thread and the business that I'm doing now is I never had a career plan. I worked with people who did. And I have to say they were mainly men. And they'd, they'd have their career mapped out and they'd be like, by the time I'm 35, I want to be at assistant director level and so on and so forth. And I'm aiming to hit board level by the time I'm in my 40s. And I was like, yep. <laughs> really? Okay, let's see how that works for you. And actually, it, it very often worked very well for them. Yeah. I, I always tended to, to drift somewhat. Uh, in, in fact, um, I kind of found my first career by accident. Um, I dropped out of university after the first year. Like I'd chosen completely the wrong course for me. Okay. Ah, and that's interesting. I'd chosen that course not because it was something that filled me with excitement and joy, but it was because it was something that I thought might please my father. Mm. And it kind of it didn't really. I think he thought I was crazy to do it, but uh, yeah. but he didn't tell me. He didn't say, "Hey, you don't do that. Follow yeah. your dream." Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I dropped out of the course, and then I spent a couple of years really, really drifting, um, not working, didn't know what to do, and then I realised I had to get my act together and do something. I got a careers book out of the library. I looked through it and I saw this one job and I thought, oh, that looks okay. That looks quite interesting. Maybe I'll go and do that. Yeah. So I based my career choice on, on reading about a page in a book. Actually, though, it, it panned out really well because it took me to OT, which I love. Okay. Then I got, I got to a point where I was, I was not burnt out, but the work I was doing started to feel really quite repetitive. Um, I was running the same groups, I was helping people with the same kind of problems, and I was thinking, yeah, do you know what, I need to do something different. And at that point, the only thing that you could do different and stay within the health service was move into management. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I saw an opportunity to, to move into a sort of junior management post and started off managing OTs within all people's services and then gradually started taking on more um, more general management roles. I, I ended up managing some nurse-led units, which was really good fun. Um, but still, with no plan in mind, I was just you know, pottering along thinking, yeah, I'm enjoying this. And then I was approached by somebody in our strategic planning team who said, would you be interested in a secondment to strategic planning? And I thought, Oh yeah, that sounds interesting. <laughs> Why not do that? So that's been that's been my plan. Oh, that sounds interesting. I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I stayed in that post. The post evolved around me, and I had all kinds of different titles. Yeah. But it was it was kind of the same job. Um, and I was still I was still helping people, but rather than helping people who had mental health problems, I was helping teams of people figure out what they needed to do and figure out how to do it better how to make plans so I, I became really good at managing projects making plans and some of the projects I did the first project I did was PMing a new build which was um, 
about, it was about three million pounds wow. worth of <laughs> I was terrified. <laughs> Um, I, I, I realised very quickly that I didn't have to be an expert on on buildings because um, <laughs> I had lots of like architects and site yeah. managers and people who actually knew what they were doing. I just had to kind of herd them a bit. I was, so I was yeah, I was a wrangler or something like that, and and I loved that, and I was actually really good at it. Um, so so that went on. I had I had a really really satisfying job helping other people figure out what they wanted and make it happen. Um, and I was good at both aspects. I was good at helping people get really clear on what they wanted, but I was also good at figuring out, helping them figure out how to make it actually come alive. Good. So everything was fine. But then we, you know, there was the huge economic downturn that's affected people globally. Um, and it affected us and it affected the health service in that the the new government decided that they were going to essentially put a freeze on public spending now that that reads very well to the public they didn't say we're going to make cuts they said we're just going to freeze we're going to give people are going to get the same budget but there is health costs inflation and actually for the health service to stay still it needs at least a four percent budget increase year on year oh wow so so in effect they were forcing cuts yeah but making it look like they weren't it was it was bad um the health service being what it is we will always 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 protect the front line if we don't have doctors and nurses and porters and cooks and cleaners we haven't got a health service yeah. so, so we we started cutting management posts and eventually i was one of the management posts that got cut my the whole team that i was in um, we were all made redundant at the same time and that was that was really hard yeah. because i had kind of drifted and gone with the flow and it had worked just fine for me i didn't have a plan and that was one of the hardest six months in my life and i because of i it's because of um, various human resource regulations and stuff like that they don't just say okay clear your desk you're gone there is a period of about maybe nine months when you know you can you know you're gonna go Wow. And you get so you you know the date that you're going to finish on, but you unless you find another job, yeah. you can't finish before then. And I was looking at other jobs, and my confidence was just shot to pieces. And I kept on looking at jobs, think and thinking, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. Even when it was jobs that were exactly what I had been doing for years and doing really well, I just. I could not do it anymore. Um, you are actually you're required to actively look for jobs during that period, and if you if, and if you don't take opportunities, they can actually say, "Yeah, you're not playing the game. Um, you're not going to have a job, and you're not going to have the redundancy pay either." Mm. And I was I was really afraid of that. So I can remember a job came up within the organisation and human resources told me about it and it was rather than being a, a planning and support post it was um quite a senior operational manager post and i just thought i can't i can't do that i knew that that would involve also having to cut services so i would be going in as a hatchet woman and i thought yeah i can't and i had a talk with the director involved and i said on paper i have the skills and experience to do it but I don't think you want me in that post and I don't think I want to be in that post and, and people were fine so the day came but other stuff had been had been happening in the background as well um, I was drawn to occupational therapy originally because I'm a really creative person I've always just had this urge to make things um, in in all kinds of ways I I love painting and writing and photography and just all kinds of stuff. There, there is not 
there's, there's some of the creative things I'm not so great at. My ceramics are nothing to be. <laughs> to be. <laughs> Clay is not my friend, um, but but I still love the creative act. Um, as as a therapist, I was sort of channeling that creativity through the work I did with patients. I used lots and some creative activity like ceramics, like arts, like drama, and I was really well aware of how powerful creativity is as as a channel for, for growth and development and healing and all kinds of good stuff and, and just having a good time. Yeah. So I'd I'd always done that. But like I said the the creativity was kind of subsumed into my work. Then when I went into management, it kind of got put on a back burner because the work was really quite intense. Um, I get so mad when the, the press managers are a really easy target and it's re the press will portray particularly public sector managers as you know they don't work very hard they drink lots of tea they tick boxes they sit at their desk twiddling their thumbs and you know what when I was a therapist I used to start work on time finish work on time and have a lunch break as a manager I would come in at seven in the morning. I would go at seven at night. Yeah. I, if I was lucky, I would have a sandwich at my keyboard. Yeah. My keyboard bore evidence of that. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty horrible. Um, so by the time I got home, I was always just so tired. Yeah. I didn't, didn't have time for me, didn't have time for my creativity. And also we were going through quite a hard time um when i haven't haven't mentioned my family I, I have one son um who is going to be 30 this summer oh same as me <laughs> i'm so proud of him he's wonderful oh, um yeah. he's actually he, he still lives at home he's saving up for a house um Good. and i think he's quite comfortable where he is um, <laughs> But he's out at the moment with his, he's in a band, um, they're recording this afternoon, they're okay. recording new material, so that's really cool and exciting, and I dare say I will get to hear some of it when he gets back. During the earlier part of my career, he, he, I was still working as a therapist when he was born, and he was quite a poorly boy. Um, he was born with heart problems, okay. and had to have surgery a couple of times. Um, and it was being a mother that really, I didn't realise the lesson it was teaching me at the time. It taught me how tough I am and how I can be in a really, really hard situation. In fact, it, it did make me think about being an adult. I can remember being, being in the hospital thinking, I don't want to be here. I'm thinking, and I have no choice, and this is what being an adult is all about, doing the stuff you really you don't want to do. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, my husband's just going out to do the shopping. Okay. Which yeah. is cool. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I learned that I could deal with awful situations and stay calm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you show me a mother who can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. We are so much tougher than we realise. Um, but this is something that women do um, or don't do. We do not give us, we don't give ourselves credit. We don't recognise our strengths. And if we do see a bit of strength, we minimise it and we'll say, oh, well, you know, anyone would have done that. <laughs> well, actually, true. no, no, anybody wouldn't have anybody couldn't have you did it you did it give yourself credit so I didn't I didn't learn that at the time I've learned that more recently but I did learn about I can do the hard stuff and I had to do the hard stuff again some years after that so I guess I can't remember how many years ago now um, I was kind of at the peak of my career doing really well my husband was a teacher and if you're a teacher in your 50s you are in a very vulnerable place because you are really expensive yeah you cost and it may well be the same in the states mm -hmm. um 
there's not it's not like an overt policy decision but the number of teachers in her in their 50s who get bullied out of their job is frightening and he was one of them mm. he was i mean he was really good as a maths teacher he used to have like the best results in in south yorkshire which is a big geographical space population of millions three years running his classes got the best exam results in the entire region wow that's wow. good yeah so you know don't don't tell me he was not a good teacher but but he was an expensive one they got rid of him and the toll on him was terrible he had a very very bad breakdown um and he he had to finish work and so overnight our income was halved that was and that was really hard to deal with yeah but, and we kind of gritted our teeth and did it and people would look at it and say that's a bit of a first world problem because I, I was on quite a good salary yeah but nonetheless if your salary overnight is cut yeah. by half and like a lot of people i kind of i live up to the limits of my income oh, yeah. <laughs> a little bit over so <laughs> So that was hard work and again showed me that I could be tough and resilient. Um, so my husband never went back into teaching and for a long time he found it very very hard to find his dream. So at the point I was made redundant he, he was working, um, he, he works in a bar it was a really nice bar it's a lovely place and the customers are really cool our, our our income took another hit i was lucky though i had a safety net because of my age i was able to i put all of my redundancy pay into my pension pot and started drawing my pension so i have a small baseline income i don't have to worry i will survive whatever happens A little while before I was, yeah, it was about five years before I was made redundant, I was coming up to 50. And I was thinking, do you know what? I, I don't want to hit 50 feeling bad about myself. And, and lots of women do, you know, 50, menopause, I'm lost my youth. What have I got to show for it, apart from stretch marks? Um, <laughs> Hey, I certainly have the stretch marks. So I, I, I made a really conscious decision that I wanted to hit 50 feeling amazing about myself, feeling powerful. Yes. And I did a load of stuff. I, um, have you heard of NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing? Yes, I have. Oh, I have. So cool. Have you done it? Yes, um, I did one time when I was in college. I did, yes. Yeah. I, so I, I did it and I, I finished my novel. And I got and I got the copy of it. That was so cool. Oh, good. Um, wow. And I wrote a play, and I lost weight. And um, the best thing that happened, though, was I was at I was at a gig that my son and his then girlfriend had arranged, and like, it was my son's band, it was a burlesque show and fashion show and stuff like that. Yeah. And there were a few stalls, people selling different things. And one of them was a jewellery stall. I love jewellery. Yeah. And I got chatting to the stall holder. And she, and she was saying, of course, you know, I, I make some stuff. But what I really love is making custom jewellery for people, hmm. doing commissions. Mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, I, would, I would love to commission a piece of jewellery. How amazing would that be? But I couldn't afford that kind of thing. And she fell about laughing and she said, no, the customer sets the budget. So you could commission something off me for like 50 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, oh, I hadn't realised that. I thought you had to be spending hundreds. Yeah. She said, not at all. And when I went home, I thought about that and thought, you know what? I'm going to commission some jewellery for myself as a birthday present from me to me. Yeah. So I went to meet up with her and and had lots of very interesting conversations about about the jewelry design um uh, and, and she she eventually made a, a suite of jewelry for me and um 
that in the middle of one of the conversations, she said, oh, I must keep my eye on the time because I have somebody arriving for a lesson. Okay. And I said, oh. And she says, yeah, I, I, I do jewellery lessons. I'm like, really? I thought, you know, that's, that's an even better present. Yeah. Could I, could I do jewellery lessons with you? And so I started going around to her house every week. And it, I was supposed to go for like maybe two hours a week. And I'd get there six o'clock after work and then suddenly we'd look at the clock and it would be like half 11 at night and I, I'd just spend hours and hours and like, like I said with, with other media like clay and stuff I love them but they don't love me back but metal I had found my thing mm. metal I because I'm quite heavy-handed metal works because you've really got to hit it some to make it move yeah. And after a few months, she said, you know, I can't take your money anymore. I'm not teaching you. You're just using my tools and stuff. And I'd love you to carry on doing that, but I just, I can't take money. Yeah. But there's a fair coming up. Would you like to share a stall? And I thought, oh. well, don't, you know, I'm fine making stuff for myself. I can't see anybody buying it. Yeah. But I thought, you know, what the heck? I can afford the store fee. So I made up a bunch of stuff and it was, it was so basic. I mean, I'm almost embarrassed to think of it now. It was really, you know, little semi precious stones on ear wires and yeah. not a lot of skill involved. Yeah. But I sold a load of stuff. And in fact, even better, I was, I had to go to a training session at work and I knew that one of the psychiatrists would be there who she was crazy about jewelry and she always wore really gorgeous pieces so i thought oh i'll take some of my stuff in and show her what i've been doing because because she'll be really interested <laughs> and so it, it came to lunch break and I, I got my stuff out and all of a sudden there was a crowd of people around the table saying oh are those for sale <laughs> well yeah and i i actually made more that lunchtime than i made at the craft fair I sold, I sold virtually everything I had and I thought that's great yeah. maybe maybe there's something in this didn't do anything about it because I'm not good at pushing myself forward then um, a pop-up shop popped up in our shopping mall and it was, it was some really nice clothes um, beautiful clothes that had been designed and made by the woman running the shop mm -hmm. And I bought some of her pieces and I got chatting with her and linked up with her on Facebook. And about six months after that, she said on Facebook, I'm, I'm opening a shop in the shopping center and it's for people who hand make stuff. It's going to be called cool. Created in Yorkshire. Yeah. So I, I emailed her straight away and said, I do jewelry. I do jewelry. Take me, take me. Yeah. So I got, in, I got into that shop from the beginning and started selling my jewellery on a regular basis and that and that was really tiny i was oh i, I was making pennies okay um my stuff was really low priced so then when i was made redundant i thought you know can i can i do something with this and and at first i mean as i said my confidence was was just blown to bits and people were saying, you've got your jewellery business. And I was thinking, oh, I don't think I can do much with it. So it's not going to bring in much money. I'm not that good. And they said, oh, well, you can do consultancy, uh, management consultancy. And I thought, yeah, me and a thousand other people who are also getting made redundant. Um, so there's a lot of ex-health service managers around. Yeah. Um, so... Two things happened. One was there is a local art organisation, the Art House, which also is a, is a physical entity. It's a huge, great building with a gallery and a load of studios. And I, I loved it to bits. And they were doing a free programme for artists to develop their confidence and also develop their commercial skills. And I signed up for that and a lot of the seminars and stuff that they did I, I was starting to think i actually know this i know about marketing from my previous job mm -hmm. i i have these skills yeah. 
I also had the, so I, I started building a network and I also had the opportunity to take a studio and I took on a studio and that helped me make the shift that again this is a female thing we do not own what we're doing so I mean the number of people I know who say ah oh, but I'm I'm not really an artist I'm not really a writer I'm not really a this I'm not really a that and I, I have a fairly stock response I, I can remember being in the printmaking studio uh, a load of us were making prints for the, it's this annual print exchange event which is really cool and one of the women who's she does the most beautiful screen prints and she said but I'm not really a printmaker I said what's that in your hand it's a print that you've just made you are a printmaker yeah. oh. Oh. and I, I have that conversation I found myself having that conversation over and over again with women in different circumstances people saying I'm not really a whatever not owning a role not feeling that they have the right to own that role and I I kind of had to do it the hard way as well I can remember the first time on the art development program when we had to introduce ourselves and I would normally have said I'm Mary and I'm a business development manager and I had to say I'm Mary I'm a jeweler and a printmaker mm. and I was waiting for somebody to say no you're not <laughs> um, well funnily enough nobody did they all went yeah um, so I started learning unconsciously about standing in my own power the other thing that happened at that time was I'd been following a particular um, business coach um, a lady called Christine Kane I don't know if you've come across her yeah so I've been following Christine's stuff and followed and signed up for one of her webinars uh which was i can remember i had to i had to stay up to about two in the morning for this webinar because of the time difference and it was an on ramp to a program she was doing then called becoming 360. Mm -hmm. i was thinking oh my god this sounds this is what i need right now this is about a couple of months after i've been made redundant and I thought, but I won't be able to afford it. And I had, I set a figure in my mind. And the figure was, uh, I don't know, was it about, it was £300 or something like that. And she got to the price. And she does, she does cut to the price pretty quickly. She's very open and kind of non-salesy. And she said the price and I thought, oh no, I knew that I wouldn't afford it. And then I thought, no, that's dollars. Do the conversion. And it was exactly, exactly the limit I'd set myself. And I thought, oh, this is meant to be. I, I signed up. It was a superb program. And at the end of it, I got an email about a three day retreat. And I'd, I'd kind of known that was there, but I'd ignored it because it was a three day retreat in North Carolina. Um, so I then I did a really manipulative thing because I thought, oh, that, you know, I, I don't do that sort of thing. I, I couldn't do that. That's not me. I printed off the email and took it to show my husband, who is not a risk taker. And, and really wasn't a risk taker at that point. And I knew, because I knew what he'd say and I knew he'd go, no, no, can't do that. So you can guess what's coming. He looked at it and went, Oh my god, that's amazing. You've got to do it. Oh. Um, so yeah, he, he said, um, he said, That's amazing, you've got to do it. And I thought, oh you bastard. And I completely, completely backed myself into a corner. And you know, I still had a bit of redundancy money left. Um so I thought, you know, what the hell, people do fly to the States. There are planes and they cross the Atlantic every day, <laughs> several times a day. Yeah. So, so I went and it was mind blowing. Okay. And, and then the same thing happened again, because of course the, the three day retreat is an open retreat and it's an on ramp to her 12 month program. Okay. And um, 
she, so she, like day two, she starts selling the, the program. And I was thinking, ah, oh, damn, I knew this was going to happen. I knew she was going to try to sell something to me. And then I thought, well, yes, because this is how her business works. Obviously, she has to tell people about her products, her offers, what have you. And I thought, and it'll be too expensive. And exactly the same thing happened. I set a mental limit. She said the price. I thought, damn. And I thought, no, do the conversion. And again, it was spot on the limit that I'd set myself. So I thought, you know what? I actually, I can pay. I can pay cash for this up front. And I'm going to do it. And that's, that was the start of the real turning point. And so the other thing I didn't know then, I know now, is find people who are going to support you. They are there. And it might be, it might be people in your immediate circle, or you might have to go a bit further out to find them. But it's not about finding people who will, who will buy into your stories and who will... Um, who will get stuck in the stories with you, who will do the, oh, poor you. Mm-hmm. Life, life's, life's hard. Um, life's not fair. Yeah. Um, but people who can, like, hold you up to being your best self, who can show you what your best self could be and who really believe that you can get there and who call you, and who call you out on your stories. <laughs> like, like, really? Are you sure? Yeah. Um, so, funnily enough, Kind of yeah. Very shortly after that, even though I had I had not been, I didn't look for consultancy work. I did set up a limited company because people, somebody said you need to set up a limited company. I thought okay, I'll do it. I was kind of like a a rabbit in the headlights. I didn't know what to do. So I had this company that had been in existence for six months or so, but had done nothing and I hadn't gone out there to people saying hey I'm here hire me and I started getting calls from people out of the blue a couple of calls that made a real difference one is a company that does bid editing um you know when when people are applying for funding or for contracts okay yeah um um, a lot of people are actually really bad at responding to the to the tender documents, uh, they, they don't know how to sell themselves, and they don't know what a word count is either. Oh. <laughs> you, would, you you would think that when people see word counts, you know, eight hundred words, they would understand that means don't write more than eight hundred words. Yeah. However, so part of part of my role there is to haul it back from. Usually, they do double the word count. Yeah, but I'm good at that. Um, so I got a call from these guys saying, I can see on LinkedIn, your status has changed. Um, w- would you be interested in doing some work with us? I'd, I'd done a bit of training with them, which is how they knew me and I loved them. So I said, oh yeah, that would be, that would be cool. And then somebody else who'd actually been working for my organization as an external consultant. Um, and he was around when I was made redundant. He asked for my details at that point, and I thought, well, he's just doing that because he feels sorry for me and he wants to make me feel a bit better. I'll never hear from him again. So then I heard from him saying, I've got some interesting work in Sheffield. Would you be interested in doing some graphic recording for it? No, that's another. Have you come across graphic recording? Uh, not recording. What is it? Oh, it's cool. Um, say you've got a workshop or a conference. Okay. What I do is I stand at the side of the room with an enormous sheet of paper and some felt tips. Oh. And I use a combination of graphics and text to capture the key points wow. of the speakers or the table <laughs> discussion. <laughs> I've done it in like meetings with... Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, I didn't know it was, a, it was something you could do professionally. That's oh, awesome. it, it is most definitely something you can do professionally. Yeah. And, and people do. Yeah. Um, and the money's not bad. Um, so I started doing that and started picking up word of mouth work. And then Christine did something that, that turned my jewellery business around. So remember, I, I had myself in one shop in a very run down mall in a very economically deprived town. 
in a county where people, Yorkshire's notorious. People, people look at the price on something and they go, how much? And so, um, so I was making pennies on my jewellery and I had signed up actually for a couple of craft fairs that were much more upmarket than the ones I was used to doing. And I was feeling quite sort of, yeah, now I've, I've, I've done, I've done my thing and we'll see what happens. And I actually won a one-on-one coaching call with Christine. Wow. And so she asked me what I was doing to build my business. I said, well, I'm doing this craft fair and that craft fair. And she said, okay, well, are there any more fairs you can do? And I said, no, nah, kind of this time of year, I've, I've signed up for all the ones that are going. There's not really anything else I can do till next year. Spot the story. And she spotted the story and she said, really? And she must have been going away on the computer. And she said, oh, well, there's, there's this one in London and you could still apply for that. So I immediately, I gave her like the, the five reasons why I couldn't possibly do that. Um, I wasn't ready. My work wasn't good enough. My work wasn't commercial enough. Uh, and I thought they were sound, logical reasons. I pride myself on being really, really logical and sensible. And she went, hmm. So, really, how, how do you know your work's not good enough? And I said, well, you know, I can tell by looking at it. And she's, uh-huh, uh-huh. And she does this really good thing that, police do as well when they're interrogating people she actually leaves a silence and you you desperate to fill the silence and in the end I had to say actually I'm scared then she said of course you are that's fine don't worry do it scared all I'm asking you to do is apply for this show and if they think your work is not ready they will not give you a stand because they have their reputation to worry about and I thought I can fill an application form and that evening, I filled in the application form. In fact, I filled in two because I noticed there was a, a similar fair in Birmingham. Now, these were not retail fairs. These were trade fairs. Okay. So, so you're selling to galleries and shops and stuff like that. And I thought, you know, I'm just, I'm so out of my depth here. But what the hell? Uh, they, will, they will have a look at my stuff. And go like, no, no, go away, little girl. So I got an email back from Birmingham straight away saying, great, love to offer you a stand. Here's the stuff you need to fill in, mm. uh, send us the money. Um, and I thought, okay, that's, that's six months away. That's fine. And the London one, they wrote back and said, um, actually, we're now full, but we will hold you on a waiting list in case there are any cancellations. Mm. Um, a couple of months later, I was sitting at the hairdressers at the time having my hair coloured, my phone went and it was the guy from this um, jewellery fair saying, I've got a cancellation, I would love you to have this. Mm. I mean, you know, he's going to say that to everybody, but still yeah. it was very flattering. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, oh, you'll need to email me about it and stuff like that. Like, I can't make a decision right now over the phone. And I said, just send me, send me the details through and I will get back to you. And I hung up and I could imagine Christine standing listening to that conversation i thought if she heard that she would kill me she would literally kill me so i phoned him back and said you know what i got you i'll I'll take the stand yeah Mm -hmm. and that fair was called international jewelry london it is one of the biggest jewelry trade fairs in europe wow and when i got there i felt and set up my stand and saw the world famous brands that were being represented, I felt physically sick. I thought, I just, this is ridiculous. I am so out of my depth here. But then I was in a section that was for handmade jewelry and I started looking around and thinking, but my stuff actually is no worse than anybody else's here. <laughs> no worse. I'm in good company here. And you know, after after the first morning i started thinking the first morning i thought i was going to die but then people came and talked to me and were really nice to me and i thought maybe i'm not going to die actually maybe this is quite nice maybe i enjoy this (laughs) and so yeah another important lesson for women 
there's this real false belief about courage. And maybe I've known this for a long time, that people think that courage is about not being scared. No. Courage is about being absolutely bloody terrified and doing something anyway. It is fine to be terrified. It is normal to be terrified. Um, do not, don't let your fear paralyze you. Um, and so often when you talk to people, in fact, I used to do this when I was working with people with really profound anxiety. I would say, what is the worst thing that could happen to you in this situation? And people would go, I might feel really sick. I might, my, my, my breathing would go all, all horrible. Um, I, I, I would feel really panicky. And I would say, do you know what? How about if the roof fell in on you? I think that would be much worse. And they go, yeah, the roof's not going to fall in, is it? And I said, okay. So the worst thing that could happen to you is actually not going to happen to you. <laughs> well, an asteroid strike, that would be, that would be pretty, pretty terrible. It would be hard to top that. It's not going to happen. So, so for, for women, I learned this with cycling as well. I, I, there was a period where I was doing quite a bit of cycling and a bit of, not, not real mountain biking, so I'm too much of a coward. And my balance is not, I really am too much of a coward. I get off to walk around scary leaves and stuff. Uh, th this is true. I do get off to walk around scary leaves. <laughs> Um, and and big gravel and stuff but um women have often have more imagination than men around all the horrible things that might happen so say you're zooming down this hill at high speed and all that's going through a bloke's head is way this is great look at me i'm going so fast and, and what's going through a woman's head is what is what could happen to me if i fall off going at this speed yep yep and what if it's, what if it's a pothole or what if a car comes and knocks me off and then the bloke's just going yeah <laughs> so so we have to learn to to acknowledge that there are obstacles there but not to be paralyzed by them um, and again, cycling has that great lesson. If you're cycling over rough ground and you see rocks or a pothole and you focus your attention on the rocks or the pothole, what will happen is you will hit them. That, <laughs> that is a surefire way of making sure that you hit them. So what you do, you acknowledge they're there and you look for the clear path and you focus on where you actually want to go. But again, Sometimes we get so so hypnotized by by the rocks, by the potholes in our lives that we don't see the clear path. And and perhaps we don't even look for the clear path. As somebody who drifted through life until about five years ago, um I I had to learn to look for my clear path. And through getting really good coaching and having really good support. I started to be able to find that path. A couple of years ago, I had an absolute breakthrough moment with one of my coaches. So my jewellery business was building up. It was not huge, but it was an awful lot bigger than when I started. And I'd, I'd got to a point where I had my work represented in about eight galleries across the country, um, some really good galleries as well. Um, and I was getting an amount of consultancy work that was really nice. Um, but it sort of felt, it didn't feel cohesive. It just felt like I was doing bits of stuff. And it was in a mindset coaching call. The person who was my mindset coach at that point, she was not normally directive in the slightest. Very classical coach in that sense. But she said something, she said, I've got to say this, I've got to suggest this. Have you ever thought of being a creative coach? And it was like, I was hit by a rail train. I thought, why didn't I think of that? Because... I'm really good at helping people get clarity. I'm really good at helping people plan. I love 
helping people and this would kind of draw together yeah. the different threads of what I'm doing yeah and that's where I am now building slowly but steadily building a coaching business my the, the sort of people I really want to work with are women who get to midlife and they've they've focused on their husbands they've focused on raising their kids they've focused on their job and um, furthering their boss's agenda and all of that and they get to a point when they suddenly think hey what about me and it might be a po the point they've reached because they they've got as far as they're probably going to get in their career you get to a point you know about 50 you think you know this this is it and then you think really is this it is this as good as it could get and so often people go yeah and it's fine and it's okay or it's the point where your kids leave home to go to college and you think oh now what do i do um and it's women who reach that now what do i do point and i know from talking to quite a lot of women um that when they get to that point if, if somebody said okay if i could wave a magic wand what would you like to do next they go i don't know because they've never thought about it um and in fact i've been doing some interviews like yourself with women um who are in that kind of demographic and a lot of them say well it feels a bit selfish really to think about that yeah yeah because you've been socialized to think that it's selfish to think because because whatever you're not thinking about yourself you're thinking about other people and it's very convenient for quite a lot of the world to keep you thinking about other people and not saying hey this is what i want so so my mission is to help people find the space to think about actually what they might want and start exploring what is it that really makes your heart beat faster what's getting in the way of you going for it and some of that might be all the stories that you're telling yourself that whole thing of having a side gig is I, I i think the way the way to go when you have a small family because you yeah you know you, you don't have the time or the energy to really throw yourself into it full time and the internet is an amazing way to to leverage that etsy being one of them the important thing is always consistency consistent effort and that's a really hard thing to learn particularly when you've just had a day full of screaming kids and one of them's got a stomach bug and they've been throwing up, up everywhere and yeah life as a mother is hard it's really hard work and you just don't want to do anything and the thing is it's really important to carve out some time even even if it's only 30 minutes a day to do something that takes your business a bit further and it might be making something and it might be writing your blog and it might be keeping up with your social media posting to facebook posting to instagram um but consistency does not happen by itself you have to plan to be consistent and so lots of mothers will know full well that they need to be organized about the shopping and the cooking and the menus and stuff like that and so what they do they sit down on a sunday and they write out what they're going to cook all week and they write out the shopping lists and they know they're good to go you do exactly the same with your business you plan what you're going to do you write it down and you figure out when you are going to do those things and some of those things you can kind of you can lump together so for social media stuff um i will take an hour at the beginning of the week to choose a theme for the week go and find myself seven really cool quotes linked to that theme so i know already i've got seven instagram posts that are good to go seven short facebook posts that are good to go and somewhere in there i'll get the inspiration for my blog yeah and and that way 
it happens or most of it happens. So be clear about what you're going to do. Be clear about why you're doing stuff. Be really intentional. So if you're a busy mother, you haven't got time to kind of thrash around and experiment and chuck stuff at a wall and see what will stick. You need to think what is what are the most important things that I need to do to move my business forward this week. And they don't have to be big things. But you just need to be clear about what you're doing and just keep that momentum going. And it's like, you know, it's like dieting and exercising and stuff like that. If you if you look at yourself now and think, damn, you know, if only I'd started dieting this time last year, I would be wearing my bikini now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and now I need to lose five stone in a fortnight, and it's and it's not going to happen, so I'm not going to do anything. So same with your business. Um, just think about the tiny little steps you can take that over the course of a year will add up. To big gains and oh the other thing for women is do not compare yourself at the beginning of your game to somebody at the top of their game we do it so we go on to Etsy and we look at somebody who's been making jewelry for the last 20 years and we think oh, yeah. my stuff's never going to be like that no compare yourself with what you were doing six months ago, 12 months ago. Now, you'll only do that if you get into the habit of not only looking forward with your planning, but also look back. Every Sunday, or Monday, end or beginning of the week, look back at what you did last week. Look back at what you achieved. Don't have to be big things. There's the small steady steps and just congratulate yourself you have always achieved more than you realized. And that then gives you that bit of motivation, that bit of push to do the stuff next week. And, and that's it, just, just be consistent, take steady small steps and you will look back. The first, the first, year, the first year I made jewelry, I think I made 80 pounds. Yep. Well, I thought, well, that was 80, 80 pounds I didn't have before, so that's not bad. Yep. <laughs> um, the next year when I started taking it seriously, I made 500. Mm-hmm. And the year after that, I made 1,000. Mm-hmm. And then yep. I made 7,000. Yeah. So it just... Builds momentum. It yeah. Did, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then find, find the level that is doable for you um recognize and recognize where the shift point is going to be for you um and the shift point might be small children starting school which immediately frees up a whole chunk of your time or it might be children starting college what have you those are points when you know you can really accelerate what you're doing and you can have that trajectory in mind. You can test out what your maximum capacity is now in your given situation. You can find all kinds of different ways of making the most of your capacity. And, you know, that's all the things about learning how to do automation, social media automation, um, getting smart about your production processes, yeah. um, all that kind of stuff. But have that, have that shift point in mind so that when it arrives you are ready for it Mm -hmm. and you can really slingshot yourself up to the next level rather than suddenly you've got all this time and you're sort of oh now what am I going to do with it Mm -hmm. so yeah Yeah. just just believe just believe in yourself loads and loads of people have really good side careers creative careers it's totally possible um, and again, all the obvious stuff about know your ideal customer. Ah, yeah, if you're a maker, I know that you love. Uh, yeah, I remember in the shop there was a woman who made. I don't know. There were these fabric sculpturey things, and they honestly they made my eyes bleed. 
to look at them. Mm. They were so horrible and garish and awful. And I said, you know, when, when you create these, who, who do you have in mind as your customer? Yeah. And she said, I just make them because I love them. I think they're so crazy and funky and stuff like that. And I was thinking, yeah. Yeah. you know, you're insane. <laughs> um, and, she, and she didn't sell them because she was making them for herself. Yeah. It may be the case, if, you, if you're lucky, maybe you represent your ideal customer. But maybe you don't. And it took me, it took me a long time to get clear on my ideal customer for jewellery. And she wasn't who I thought she was. I, I thought I was designing stuff for people in their, you know, twenties, stuff like that. And realised that no, my ideal customer is actually in her fifties or sixties and she's got a decent chunk of disposable income. Mm -hmm. As long as I kept designing stuff for people who you know, otherwise they would buy their jewellery from Topshop or places like that and they'd be buying stuff made out of plastic and disposable yeah. and what have you. I would never make any money at all. Yeah. If I targeted the more affluent mm -hmm. older woman who doesn't have to follow the crowd, yeah. then I would find people who would buy my work. And I went from selling pieces that were £15 to selling pieces that were 150 pounds mm. and the first time I sold one of those I felt really ill and I had to sit down for five minutes <laughs> and think, what did that woman think she was doing I was almost going like stop no you don't want to buy it <laughs> in fact I, I had an open studio evening and so it was one of the first open studios I did and this woman came in and she she saw the earrings and she said oh no I've got loads of earrings and I thought damn and then she saw a necklace and said, oh, I really love that necklace. And then, like, the earrings were cheap and the necklace was not, the necklace was about £130. Okay. And she said, yeah, I'm going to take that necklace. And then she said, oh, do you know, I might as well have the earrings to go with it. Uh -huh. And I thought, great. And I made the sale. I did her a little discount on it. And then she saw a cuff bracelet that was the same price as the necklace. And she said, oh, oh, I wish I'd seen that. I want that as well. And I said, these words came out of my mouth. I said, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> and actually, yes, she was sure. She bought, she bought the bracelet wow. as well. Wow. So, so ladies, believe in yourselves. Um, be really clear about your IC. Um, work consistently. And you'll get there. And you'll have a lot of fun along the way.